Hi everyone and welcome to Let's Talk Diversity. I'm really pleased to have Dr. Peter Corey with us today. Uh, Peter, thank you for joining us. Would you like to start by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your career background? Well, hi, I'm uh, Peter Corey. I, I was a pediatrician in Bradford from 1986 to about eight or nine years ago. Uh, uh, as you may guess from my accent, I grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, I, I qualified Queen's University there in 1972 in medicine. And then I did training in pediatrics, mainly in Northern Ireland, but at one year in Cardiff in Wales and one year in Barbados. And uh, I wanted to work with children with disabilities. So I took a job in Bradford, um, as the first consultant and community pediatrician they'd had. Uh, and my job was really to work with the children in the Child Development Centre there. And what was your reason to, was there any reason behind wanting to work with children with disabilities? Is that something you'd always wanted to do? Oh, uh, but things changed over the years. Um, when I was a teenager, I thought I'd be do geography and become an explorer for oil. Uh, and I had thought of medicine. I had an uncle who was a doctor, uh, but I thought that I wouldn't like blood, so that would put me off. But when I was about 17 or so, I realized, well, actually, I could cope with blood. So uh, I applied for medicine and got in. Uh, pediatrics children, uh, I th the first job I had as a, as a, a houseman, you know, the first month I qualified, I was working in a children's ward and I enjoyed it. Uh, in those days, it was quite leisurely. Uh, the children would often come into hospital for one or two weeks and that's with straightforward things like asthma and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so you got you had plenty of time to get to know them. Um, and I just liked pediatrics and I kept doing it. I wasn't very good at my exams, but uh, I kept at it and eventually passed my specialist exams and uh, and then got the job in Bradford. Okay. Disabled kids, uh, it's horses for courses. Some, some people are action men or action women who want to uh, spend an hour or two doing an operation and make somebody better just like that. Uh, other people are more... Um, uh, looking at the long term um, and I, I enjoyed the relationship you had with with the families a bit like a GP where whenever I saw a baby with a disability I would generally be looking after them uh, at hospital level for the next 15 or 16 years so you got to know them and their families very well which I liked yeah I suppose from my own personal experience as well, that is a, as from a mother's perspective, it is that relationship is really important, developing that trust in, in a paediatrician as well. I think then it's difficult though, when you have to transfer over to the adult team, when you've had that, you know, that relationship with a paediatrician can be challenging. So can you, can you tell me a little bit about your ethnicity and, and religion? Well, um, Northern, well, it's a, it's a bit complicated. I'm Northern Irish, so I come from the part of Ireland which is still British in the northeast of Ireland. Uh, I my family was Presbyterian, which is a branch of Protestantism. Uh, uh, so I grew up in Northern Ireland uh, as one of the, basically at that time, two thirds of the people in Northern Ireland who felt they were British and by religion were Protestant. Uh, about the other third or so were, uh, felt they were Irish and uh, were generally of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, we did have other groups, but very, very, very small. I think there was a community in Belfast of two or three or 400 Jewish people. And by the 60s and 70s, we were getting a few doctors from India and Pakistan and a few other places. Um, there were a few Chinese restaurants opening up, but really compared with England, uh, we were not a very diverse community. 
although we had the two main groups in Northern Ireland, the, the British Protestant and the Irish Catholic groups. And can you tell me a little bit about your culture and the, the things that were important to you growing up? Basically, we did British history, so we felt uh, we felt we were British in, in my part of the community. Uh, so the royal family and the uh, I was very chuffed when I was a kid going to London, seeing the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace, um, uh, reading the uh, what do you oh dear I can't remember the Enid Blyton books. The, is it the famous, famous five? Famous five, yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, um, and then I th Nor the Northern Ireland. Uh, Protestant links were probably more with Scotland than they were with, I mean, with England. With England, there was Westminster Parliament and the Royal Family and the British Army. Uh, and a couple of friends are very clever. They went to Oxford and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we probably, our family holidays, my grandmother and my aunts and so on would have holidays in Scotland. Uh, so there was quite a strong link between the, the, the group that I was from, which was sometimes called the Ulster Scots, uh, living in Northern Ireland. Can you tell me a little bit about the diversity within Bradford? Uh, well, with Bradford, leaving Belfast to go to Bradford in 1986 was a different world. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'd already, I'd, I'd spent one year working in Barbados, so I was a, a, a minority of the uh, in fact, I was an outside. I was a an incomer uh, mm -hmm. in Barbados for a year. Uh, the minor, the majority there were Afro Caribbean black population. Uh, that had been interesting, and that was about uh, ten years before I went to Bradford. Bradford was a new world, uh, and coming as an outsider, I think I found it very interesting because you had the the established white British population, the Yorkshire population, mm -hmm. uh, and with their accents, and then, which I had to, I had to come to terms with, and they had to try to understand me. Um, and then you also had uh, the multi-ethnic population, although in Bradford, it, it wasn't so much multi-ethnic, it was the, the, the Pakistani population was the big minority segment. There were some Indian uh, people and Afro-Caribbean people as well, but not in the same numbers as the Pakistani population. So yeah. it was very interesting. Uh, I took an interest then. I'd always been interested in history uh, and geography. So I, I did read up a bit about India and Pakistan. Um, even went to Urdu classes for a couple of years. So, although I never really, never really got good enough for that. Yeah. And with the families that, that you worked with, did you ever um, did you ever experience where either families made assumptions and stereotypes towards you, or did you ever see um, were there any assumptions and stereotypes made about the families that you were working with? I find that very difficult, and you know, to remember and to uh, mm. remember how I felt at the time. There were there were stereotypes, I'm sure. Uh, in both directions uh, and sometimes community because of communication difficulties and that was partly language mm. so people who I'd, I didn't speak the language of the uh, Asian folk I mean I learned a little bit of Urdu but not enough to do anything with um, and because of their or, or some of them their lack of fluency in English uh, it was difficult to get the correct message across mm. when things were fairly straightforward like what time's breakfast and when will you go home fine but when it became complicated as to the the outlook for a child uh, how they would develop uh, what mm. problems they might have to, that's quite complicated so it's 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 very difficult to get complex um, ideas across in a different language even using a very good interpreter mm. um, so there were there were misunderstandings. My misunderstanding of what the families felt and wanted, and their misunderstandings of what I was doing, 
Mm, yeah. And what was your experience of using interpreters? Do, do, did you, do you find interpreters helpful? Did just, you know, using an interpreter create a barrier in itself in some ways? It did, yeah, it, it brings another person into the equation, which mm. is a bit of a barrier. Uh, but uh, the good interpreters, uh, especially when you got when you got to know them and they got to you, know you and the way you both worked, uh, mm. I think that added to things, not just the language. Um, they would pick up on what the parents were uh feeling and understanding and be able to feed that back to you mm. right at the time so you could then respond to that. Yeah. One of the one of the situations I remember from the early days was a Bangladeshi family and the mother used to come to the clinic uh, and we used an interpreter, although it wasn't always the same interpreter. And this lady sat there and never said a word. Uh, she never had any questions for me. But she came back to a clinic and she was accompanied by a Bangladeshi uh, worker from the Portage Scheme, one of the early mm. uh, intervention programs. So this interpreter had got to know the mother very well. And blow me, but one day the mum came and the interpreter produced a list of questions from the mum. And that was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, the, my my assumption was that this lady's not taken in very much and i really you know i didn't see how i could help her uh but with this interpreter that she'd got to know uh she was able then to express herself and things went much much better from then on yeah yeah it sounds like you really took time to develop your own cultural competence as well looking at how you'd learn about than and how you'd even tried to, to learn some of the language. Do you think, um, is it common for people to, to make an effort to develop their own cultural competence within the health service, do you think? It is a bit, uh, but uh, one of the first things is time and energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and medicine, nursing, uh, doctoring, and the, the other profession is generally very busy. And doing these extra things uh, is not easy. Mm. But if the, if the employer, if the hospital puts a bit of effort into it, uh, it can be good. So we had a very, very good chaplaincy service in Bradford, uh, which is a multi-faith chaplaincy service. So the chaplains, in particular the Muslim chaplains, but we also had Sikh and Hindu ones, uh, they could go to meetings with the health staff and professionals and answer their questions and give information, which then helped bridge the gap, and did, uh, you know, did it did it help you increase improve your knowledge? Yeah. I, I've always been interested in reading and finding out about things in history. I a lot of the books I used to read were historical and exploration around the world, mm. initially from the European aspect, you know, Christopher Columbus and that mm. sort of thing. But um, it was finding, I was particularly interested in how one community uh, tackled the, the interaction with another community. Mm -hmm. uh, the people from um, North Africa, uh, Middle East, uh, and India, Pakistan, Iran, Persia, who came to Europe and how they saw things and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so that's probably my, my interest in that sort of thing has helped. And can you tell me a bit about the diversity of the workforce within the health service in Bradford? So I know you've, you've worked within hospitals and with genetics teams as well. Is there much diversity within staff teams? It's, yes, uh, there is, and it's changed a lot. Uh, there always was some. So when I was a young doctor in Northern Ireland, one of the minority ethnic groups I came across were the young doctors from India and Pakistan, Bangladesh. Uh, so there always were doctors uh, multi from different ethnic groups in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much in other health professionals, but again, over the years, um, in Bradford, we've had speech therapists, dietitians, nurses uh, from the diverse communities. And that's been mm -hmm. 
gr gradually growing. Yeah. And that's been useful. Yeah. And what do you think are the benefits of having a diverse team? And do you think there are any negatives? Mostly, but mostly positive. Uh, mm. For from the patient's point of view, they they will realise that uh, there's somebody there who understands them better. Uh, when they've established a long-term relationship with a member of health staff, whether no matter what ethnic group they're from, when it's a long-term relationship, they generally then build up some understanding and um, and better communication. Uh, but having the staff from the different communities is definitely beneficial to that. And then the staff themselves. So if, um, for instance, if an Asian staff had questions about the Yorkshire culture, they can ask one of the white British staff. Mm -hmm. that, when I say Asian staff, I'm talking about the, the first generation ones, the, the people who've qualified in Asia and come to the UK. But now, of course, the situation's changed further in that we have British health professionals from all ethnic groups, which is, mm -hmm you know, even better. And do you, still, do you still think there's work to be done? So do you think, I mean, I know you've done some work with charities in the past. Do you think charities need to um, become more diverse and inclusive? Yeah, some of them already are, but I think uh, it's one of the weaknesses. And that's why I was very pleased to hear that breaking down barriers were starting a few years ago. Uh, Charities dealing with a particular condition or groups of conditions, it's full of enthusiastic, committed people who are wanting to do their best for children and adults who've got such and such a condition. Mm. Uh, they're enthusiastic. They, they make things happen. But uh, in the early days, anyway, they generally start with uh, English speaking uh more confident people, often middle class, but not, mm. not always nowadays. Uh, and they don't always have the um, experience themselves. They don't always have the back, the support and mm. the resources uh, to know how to involve other communities. Uh, so I think a lot, a lot of community, a lot of um, charities and patient bodies and things I've been associated with have had difficulties. Mm. Uh, some of them have overcome those uh, very well, but I think some of them still having difficulty and that's where I think they could do with support. Mm. Yeah. And, and have you got any suggestions on what those charities could do and where they could find that support? Well, nowadays I'd say people like you and breaking down barriers. Uh, I did wonder about 20 years ago, uh, I was wondering whether the local councils uh, could find staff from the minority groups who could uh, help the local uh, patient groups or support groups to be more diverse. Mm. I think that would have been useful uh, because we've got to remember that most charities are run by lay people. They're not trained doctors, psychologists, sociologists, social workers, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're starting from a position where the condition, first of all, is very new and strange to them until they had a family member who have, has it. Uh, but then the other cultures may be different for, and new to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've worked in Bradford, so I've been very, very much exposed to a multicultural community. But if you look at some of the smaller towns and cities in the UK, uh, there maybe aren't as many minority ethnic people there. Mm. Uh, I don't know the statistics, but I would say that an awful lot of minority BME people in the UK live in the cities. Uh, so it's an, for somebody coming from a country, a rural place, it's, it's a new experience. One of the things I'm particularly interested in at the minute, looking at the obviously the impacts of COVID-19 and the, the work that the government and local authorities are doing to, to make sure that people have access to information to be able to make a, a, an, an informed choice around whether or not to, to have the vaccine. 
you know, I've been wondering whether, you know, we could learn some lessons within breaking down barriers and, you know, working with families genetics, whether there's lessons to learn from the experiences of COVID-19, but also wondering whether local authorities will, will also be more willing now to do very specific pieces of work in terms of engaging with community leaders and, um, you know, making sure that families have access to accessible information. Do you think that things may change after COVID? I would hope so. Uh, mm -hmm. hope. COVID is another challenge and it's, it's brought out some bad things, but it's also brought out some very good things. Mm -hmm. and again, in Bradford, which I know about, there have been some great uh, initiatives mm -hmm. to have professionals and community leaders and just ordinary people from various mm -hmm. communities talking about COVID, talking about immunizations and so on, mm -hmm. and trying to reassure people. Yeah. Unfortunately, nowadays, it's, it's a battle against uh, social media and other such uh, things that, that can where, where false ideas or rumours can spread, not always with the backup of good knowledge. Yeah, and I think it's quite difficult to get the balance right as well. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of media at the minute around, around you know, uptake in of the vaccine within ethnic minorities and I think on one hand it's a good thing in that they're really thinking about the information and the you know getting across information in, in an accessible way but I think on the other hand it's also it, you know my worry is that it's going to stigmatize particular communities as well you know when we look at vaccine passports and things and looking at uptake and trying to get control of the virus what I wouldn't want it to do is to cause more issues for for people from ethnic minorities communities as well so I think it's I think it can be a difficult balance yep but I think uh if I would change things about the response to COVID virus I would go back 20 years okay. I think well I think one of the problems is there are a lot of things we have taken for granted and mm -hmm. just accepted and not done anything about if mm -hmm. you had established the better community relations the better involvement patient involvement rather than professions if that had all been long-standing so that members of minority groups were more used to being included in the mm. conversation i don't think we'd have as many of the issues as we do now yeah but you can't go back but at least hopefully what we do now with covid uh, if we can keep it up then that will help in future situations with you know to do with health yeah, I mean, we've touched on, you know, how services um, could develop more cultural competence and, and be more accessible. But, you know, why do you think it is that some families do find it difficult to engage with services? I find it, well, on this, as a service provider, uh, I would find that difficult as I was on the other side. Mm. But I think some of it is... Uh, not so much cultural competence for the families, but uh, being used to being ta taken into account, being used to people listening to you. Mm. Uh, and my impression is that a lot of people from any ethnic group, whether it's, you know, white British people, uh, non-professionals, uh, and certainly in, in minority groups, mm. uh, they aren't very confident when they're talking to professionals, um, partly because of their background, partly because of social status and so on, mm -hmm. and expectations. So I think as much as possible, we've, we've got to include everybody. Yeah. It's not always easy, it's not always possible, but there should be more attempts. Yeah. And are there any examples um, from your experience around any kind of service that's done, you know, really good pieces of work within the Bradford area or beyond where they've really looked at the needs of the community and developed the services around that? Well, genetics, I, I wasn't directly involved in genetics, but a lot of the children I looked after had got genetic conditions mm. and a lot, a lot of them were from BME families. And shortly after I was appointed, the following year, 1987, uh, Professor Bob Muller appointed the first transcultural genetic counsellor mm. 
So we had a lady in West Yorkshire who spoke Urdu and several other Asian languages. <coughs> and I could see that helping. It took quite a long time, but gradually, gradually, uh, the information was being given in their home language, the mm. first language uh, to the families. Uh, and the understanding gradually grew. Uh, it ended up with a team of genetic counselors who spoke various languages. Mm. Uh, so that I think was, was a thing that was very helpful. And can you tell me a bit about, I know one of your, you're very passionate about wanting to support people in other countries as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I've just, uh, we have been considering in the UK how maybe we should have things in, translated uh, and that would be useful, but uh, translation uh, for this very detailed medical genetic issues is quite complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are not, there aren't always the, the words available, uh, but in, in Europe, uh, we can get, if we, instead of interpreting a British thing into German or French or Spanish, why don't we communicate with the Spanish groups and the German groups and so on and use what they have? It'll not be the same situation with regard to the National Health Service and so on, but about the conditions, it will be the same. Um, there, is, there has been a lot of research between European countries, North America, Australia and so on, but uh, can we get the links going with places like India and Pakistan? Mm. Um, for instance, in the UK, uh, it's people like the, the uh, pediatricians and geneticists in West Yorkshire and Birmingham and London who've uh, had to face up to a lot of conditions in Asian families, which was new to us. Uh, but out in India and Pakistan, there are going to be a lot of children with those conditions. Uh, so the staff out there will have the practical experience. Uh, and if we could link in their practical experience with the scientific knowledge here, the, and also the data, um, we have got a health service where every child, the birth is registered. Mm -hmm. In some countries that doesn't happen. So they don't even know how many children have been born, let alone how many children have been born with uh, rare and complicated conditions. So I think there's a lot of stuff we can do together. I was pleased that Born and Bradford, the, uh, the research program in Bradford following up, uh, I think it's about 13 or 14,000 babies mm. uh, have, have now got links with another program in Pakistan, Children of Pakistan, which is a birth cohort there. So hopefully we'll gradually be improving the communication and links and when you look at the developments in genetics and genomics since since you since you retired, do you see those as positive developments, or do you expect? Did you think that things would develop quicker than they have done? I'm I'm rusty with regard to what's happened since I retired, uh, mm -hmm. partly because I don't understand it all now. It's developed mm -hmm. so quickly, so the the having the knowledge is great. So there is uh, an awful lot more specific knowledge about rare genetic conditions. And that means that things like testing during pregnancy, mm -hmm. giving advice during pregnancy or even before the baby's conceived, mm -hmm. uh, that's all feasible. Mm -hmm. Whether we have the infrastructure, even in the West, to do all that, because it, it's very time consuming. It takes a lot of, even in English, it mm -hmm. takes a lot of time because lay lay people won't know won't be used to talking about genetics. Mm -hmm. When I take my car in to be serviced, I haven't a clue what's going on. The the mm -hmm. garage guy says this needs done, that's need. I basically have to go with the flow. Mm -hmm. But with that's not good enough in genetics and medicine. You know the families really do have to understand, and that can take a long time in English, let alone when it's been translated. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. I think, you know, the technology is advancing very quickly and, you know, the infrastructure, but I think there's still families need support to understand and interpret that information as well. And I think, you know, we we, we need far more genetic counsellors in this country to be able to provide support to the families, um, you know, that, that they need. So fingers crossed. 
that comes down to resources. Yeah. So, and things that things that change a lot. When I went to Bradford, I was the fifth of the five pediatric consultants. Mm. I think now they're about thirty. Yeah. But they're still very very busy mm. because we didn't have time to talk to families in the in the early days. Uh, we were dealing with big big clinics and just doing the what was necessary at the time. Whereas now there's there's more knowledge. Mm. Uh, we didn't know about a lot of the conditions, uh, and that all costs money, and that's where there's an uh, there's always a battle between uh, people not wanting to pay more tax and mm. uh, the needs of the health service as well as other things. I've been very pleased how some things have developed, mm. uh, and. In my time, the, basically the last 30, 40 years, we now have so many uh, local BME staff involved. Mm. Um, and that's made a great difference. So the, a lot of the staff in hospitals understand where the families are coming from by, through direct experience. Um, so the science has improved. The, the uh, diversity of the staff has improved, mm. uh, but there are still a lot of restrictions and restraints. And we just, we, we, you know, we always need to do better. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter. That were really useful. And thanks for sharing your thoughts and your experience. It's, it's been fabulous. So if anybody else would like to take part in Let's Talk Diversity, we'd love to hear from you. Please contact us.